Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 2016 Cambridge Science Festival. Um, it's our 22nd year um, as a science festival, and we're absolutely delighted to be able to host this event with Microsoft Research. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, we haven't got a fire alarm planned, and so if it does go off, uh, for those of you in the front, the fire exit is through the doors here. For those of you at the back, just outside the, the um, lecture theatre here and outside a door straight ahead of you. Um, we're delighted both to welcome Dave Coplin and also Professor John Norton to this event. John is one of our Science Festival patrons. He's a fellow at Wilson College at the University of Cambridge and has written extensively on the intersection of science and technology and society. And so it provides an absolutely perfect chair for this event. Can I introduce John? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you for coming. Um, welcome to uh, one of the nicer buildings in Cambridge. Um, it's, it's even nicer than you think, but you have to be allowed upstairs to see. Um, but believe me, it is. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Dave uh, Coplin, who has an absolutely fantastic job title. He is the Chief Envisioning Officer for Microsoft UK. How about that? And he's an established leader in the role and thinking about the role of technology in our personal and professional lives. He's worked across a wide range of industries and customers, providing strategic advice and guidance around the intersection of a modern society and technology, both inside and outside of the world at work. Uh, and on the sixth day, he rests. He's passionate about turning the base metal of technology, as he puts it, into valuable assets that affect the way we live, work, and play, and in so doing, move the focus from the technology itself to the outcomes it enables, which I think is the focus of what he wants to talk about today. His first book, entitled Business Reimagined, provided a view of a new working environment based on a collaborative and flexible working. His latest book, The Rise of the Humans, provides a further call to action for both individuals and organizations to harness what he calls the digital deluge, to rise up and take back control of the potential that technology offers our society. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce this revolutionary Dave Coplin. Thanks, John. Uh, well, hi, everybody. Well, it's going to be a long afternoon. Hi, everybody. There we go. So, hi, my name's Dave. Uh, I work for Microsoft, and please understand, I have a comedy job title, because I am, check me out, I am Microsoft UK's Chief Envisioning Officer. Come on, I work in IT. Job titles are all I've got, right? And the thing is, I chose the job title specifically because I have a really interesting angle on what's happening in the world of technology. I work for an organization that you will well know loves to talk to you about the technology and the products we make. We love talking about that stuff. But what we don't do enough of for my money is not to talk about the technology, but talk about the human beings that use it. So my job is essentially to project out into the future and try and understand how a human being is going to want to live, work, and play. Because I think if we understand what the humans are going to do, we can be a lot more mindful about the kind of technology they're going to require. So understand then, at a certain level, my job is essentially about the future of humanity, right? And I just figured if I'm going to have a job about the future of humanity, I deserve, nay, I demand a job title with a certain degree of pomposity. I think you'll see I've achieved that. I also chose this job title because when I was a kid, I said to me, Mum, I said, Mum, one day, I'm going to be CEO at Microsoft. You just want me. <laughs> and for years, I've got away with that because I never had to tell her, but she's actually sat in the fourth row, so she's just found out I never got the job. Sorry, Mum. Um, I also have to give a bit of background about me. I stand in front of you, an individual who's dedicated his entire career to the world of IT. I have spent 25 years inside the second smallest room inside most organizations. These are the rooms with no natural daylight, just the blinking of the LEDs and the whirring of the fans to keep me company. I've chosen to work for one of the world's largest technology companies. I have gone to the extremes of personal grooming to grow a beard and a ponytail. That's how committed I am. And guess what? I also quite like Star Trek, man. Right? This is my eighth birthday party. It's my mum and my auntie Mabel. Stick with me, I'll make it relevant, right? 
the thing is, when I was a kid, Star Trek taught me this really important lesson. It taught me that technology is supposed to be a force for good in our society. It's this thing that enables human beings to rise up and achieve more than they ever could do on their own. This is the point of technology. It's the gift that, it, that technology offers our society. But my problem, my problem is those 25 years in IT. Because I look around at how we all use technology today, and I don't see this liberating force. I see a prison. I see something that constrains how we work, controls how we think. And quite frankly, I refuse to accept that as our future. So a few years ago, I set out on a different journey. I wrote a book called Business Reimagined, which John talked about, which is essentially about how the way we work today doesn't work. And it's based on a few obvious principles. The first one is this. We live in an incredible time. Could you humor me? Could you put your hand up if you have a computer at home? Right? That's number one. Right? Number two is keep your hand up if the computer you have at home is better than the one you use at work or the one you have access to at school. Wow, what a surprise. It's almost everybody. It's a question I ask every audience because it's a really important question. I love it. If it's, do we have anybody from the public sector in the audience today? A few people. I love it. When the public sector, because it's like shooting fish in a barrel, right? That question at that point. But the reality is it doesn't matter what industry you're in, what size of the company that you're in, what you do, the answer to that question is always the same. People have a richer experience of technology in their personal lives than they're allowed to in their professional lives, and that's just mad. We have grandparents Skyping their grandkids. You guys know this, you live online, you shop online, you play online, you have this amazing experience of technology in your personal life, it does amazing things for you, and then you go to work, or you go to school. And this is how most people feel about technology in those environments. And you're greeted at the door by some long-haired, beardy git like me in IT who just loves, just loves to say, nah, you can't do that. And I don't understand that. Because I've spent the majority of my career chasing people down corridors like some bizarre, freakish stalker, just trying to get them to care about what technology might do for them. These days, that chase still happens, but it's the other way around. You guys chase me down the corridor wondering why you can have such a rich experience of technology in your personal lives, and yet you're constrained in how you work. And we have to change this. But the real issue of how we work comes down to something that's much more insidious. It's this thing that's supposed to be the savior of how we work. It's this thing called productivity. But our problem as a society is we've forgotten what productivity means. The way we think about productivity today was defined by the Industrial Revolution. It has become a cold economic formula. It is output per unit of input. And for the last 200 years, our society has been fixated on productivity being all about the process of work. It's about efficiency rather than the product of work, the effectiveness of what we do. And the issue of that focus puts all of the effort, all of the energy in the wrong space. It gets us to use the tools to work in old-fashioned ways. Microsoft did a survey of the UK workforce. We asked a representative sample of the UK workforce, what constitutes a productive day at work? 77% of the respondents said a productive day at work was clearing their email inbox. This is not good. And if you have a problem with why that's bad, let me remind you that email is the process of work. It is not the actual work you're supposed to be doing. So we have to change this. And also, this belittles the potential of technology because it constrains us to working practices, the working practices and processes that define our businesses. But these are processes that were fundamentally defined in the 19th century by our Victorian forebears, people who were wanting to create the first ever organizations. And all we've done with technology today is we've taken those old Victorian working processes and we've kept them intact. It's just that now we use technology to make them a bit quicker or a bit cheaper. This belittles the gift that technology can deliver. We have to change that. And then the final piece of the puzzle is you guys, the people who enter the workforce, the people who are in work. Because the reality is that most people are not engaged in what they do. I cannot get the workers to work harder because they simply don't care. Workplace engagement is a massive problem that faces us pretty much around the globe. The numbers in the UK will tell you that 83% of the UK workforce is disengaged at work, not really that bothered about what they do. Same numbers around the US. In the US, it's 71%. So unless we can get the people who are in our organizations to care about what they're doing, they're never going to want to change. They're never going to want to use the technology in the right place. And here's where the second part of the story comes in. And this is with the second book called The Rise of the Humans. And this is really the story I want to focus on today. There's a couple of things I should tell you about the books, right? The first thing is I'm a cheap date, right? So if you're interested in these books, you can get them for free. You can get them for free from Amazon if you have a Kindle or a Kindle app. Or if you don't have a Kindle, just tweet me or email me, whatever you want, and I'll send you a download code. 
The second thing I have to tell you about these books, and I'm not really proud to have to admit this in public, but there was a period in my life where I was pretty much down on my luck and I needed money and you know, I did some of the things that I'm not terribly proud of and, and I was a management consultant. And <laughs> as a result of being a management consultant, you will find no answers in these books because ladies and gentlemen, I was a good consultant. These books are just provocations. They are a poke in the ribs for us to think differently about our technology. But let me take you through the story. So I believe we live in a place I call the digital deluge. This is a world where we are surrounded by too much information. And interestingly, we complain about it like it's a new thing. And we say, oh, I can never find anything. There's all too much here. But I would argue that since the invention of the printing press, our society has access, had access to more content than any single individual could consume in their entire lifetimes. The fact that today, thanks to the internet and computers, we have 10 times more or a bazillion times more, it doesn't matter. We still have more. But what really makes the problem special today, what really makes it acute today, is these things. These beautiful, lovely, engaging, personal devices that are with us from the minute we wake up until the moment we go to sleep. Now, be honest, who amongst you, first thing this morning when you woke up, you check your phone? Last thing at night? And this is the problem, right? Because we now have access to this stuff wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and as a result of all of the incredible things we can do with mobile technology, most people are still here. Quick random sample of this audience. Who amongst you does not get enough email? <laughs> right? I don't even have to write a punchline to that joke. We get the pain. This was not the gift of what we were supposed to deliver with technology. This is the problem of where we are with how we use technology. Now, I have a really simple philosophy for how you predict the future, and it's basically if you want to predict the future, the best way to predict the future is simply to better understand the past. And it's based on that philosophy that I would like to place all of the blame for our current problems with technology, all of the blame rests with one single individual. One person's responsible for the problems we face today. It's a Scotsman, and it's Alexander Graham Bell. What a bastard, eh? Here he is, he has this amazing invention, right? In 1875, if you wanted to communicate as human beings and you were separated by geography, the only choice you had would be to engage in machine-to-machine -machine communication. It's the only choice you had. His invention in 1876 turned that into a human experience. Human beings could, for the first time ever, engage in something that was very natural. They could talk to each other even though they were separated by geography. But we didn't stop there. We carried on and on and on. We live in this amazing world where thanks to these devices, I can stand pretty much anywhere in the world and I can connect and talk to anyone else anywhere else in the world. But a really interesting thing has started to happen. Because as the technology has become more and more pervasive in our everyday lives, we're starting to see a dark side emerge. Because as good as the technology is at connecting people who are geographically separated, Increasingly, it's disconnecting people in the same physical space. And you'll see this all around you. How many of you work in an open plan office? Right? And technology is really problematic because what technology does in an open plan office is it disconnects people from each other. How many times do you catch yourself sitting in your open plan office at your open plan desk with your open plan laptop and your lucky gonk and you're emailing the person who's sitting next to you? You know, what time are we going for lunch? I don't know. Where are we going to go? I don't know. They're there. Just talk to them. We don't do that. Technology disconnects us. It happens at home. If you have kids, you'll be familiar with this picture. Let me tell you about family time in the Copland household. We will once in a while, from time to time, say, do you know what? Wouldn't it be nice? Let's all sit down together at the table for dinner as a family, quality family time. Right? And I'll sit down. My son sits down. My wife sits down. Within minutes, my work phone is out. I'm checking my email. My son sees that, he's like, all right, game on. He brings out his <clears throat> nameless tablet device, think about it. <laughs> My wife's looking at the two of us, she's thinking, well, you know, you can't beat him, join him. She's on Facebook. At this point, nobody is talking. We are locked in our own individual little digital worlds. We'll sit and watch a movie as a family on the weekend. I guarantee you when we watch a movie as a family on the weekend, there will be two out of the three of us looking at the small screen in our laps rather than the big one right in front of us. Technology is disconnecting us. It happens in real life. How many times do you go to some big public event? I don't know, New Year's Eve in Trafalgar Square, a concert, only to see hundreds, if not thousands, of people enjoying the event from four inches behind a glowing wrecked. What is that about? I went up to a bloke. I said, what are you doing? He said, I saw, I, I got an HD camera on my phone, right? And I'm like, yeah, so have I. It's called my eyes. You know, bizarre. The thing is, what we've got to realize is that we are all 
just the first generation of the, of the, we are the first digital society, the first generation of a digital society. We're still figuring out how this stuff actually works. And because we don't know how it works, and because we don't know how it actually could add value to our lives, we've invented a series of coping mechanisms that we think help with a world of too much information, but in fact hinder what we're able to do. I'm going to talk to you about three of these coping mechanisms. The first one is something I call skimming, and this is where we skim across the surface of the ocean of information without ever taking time to dive deep. And you'll come across this in a number of different ways. You can come across this at work, and you come across it in the email that you send your boss, and you get a response that basically says, don't send me a long email. If you can't summarize it into two or three bullets, it's not worth saying. Or maybe you've got some millennials, and there are a few here today in the organization, and you send your long email and you get a response back that simply says, TLDR. Anybody had that yet? Too long, didn't read. The bloke at the back, I'm having that, yeah. Right? And the problem is, right, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be focused, and I'm not saying that brevity isn't always important, but the reality is you have to recognize what you throw away when you get those messages and you make them shorter is you throw away context. And without context, you, make, you massively increase the risk that the decisions you make based on that information will be wrong. And what you need to do is you need to make a positive, conscious choice about whether that context is important. Now, skimming is supported by another coping mechanism I call snacking. And this is pretty much down to these devices, because thanks to these devices, I can fill in every nook and cranny of every available moment of my waking day to skim on more information. And you see this happen all around you. I work in London a lot. You see it classically on the tube. It takes 45 seconds to get from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom of an escalator. What you'll see in those 45 seconds is thousands of commuters using that quality time to catch up on their email. You see it in other ways. I'll give you another personal example. When I was writing the book, I was aware I had this really terrible behavior because I would be putting my son to bed and I love to give him, read him a story when he goes to bed. And I found that in the proceedings, I was starting to become absent. Because what would happen, there's this little window of time, right, between when he's getting into his pajamas and when he's actually in bed waiting for his story. And in that window of time, he's off in the bathroom brushing his teeth. There is nothing I can do at that moment to help him. And that's like two minutes. So what do I do with two minutes? Well, I do with two minutes what any busy working parent does with two minutes. I stuff my hand in my pocket, have a quick look at me phone, and I'll just see what's going on at work. Now, the problem is not so much that I've done that, it's the impact on my cognitive state. Because the minute I look at my work email, mentally, I am no longer at home. All of the baggage, all of the stress, all of the chaos of the office comes flooding right back. Now, best case, my son gets into bed and he has a story from a slightly distracted dad. Worst case, I get one of those emails, and we all get one of these emails from time to time. This is the email from your boss or your colleague or the client, or whatever it may be, that sends you into a froth of, I can't believe they said that. If I get one of those emails, he can forget his story. I'm off to, oh, I'm going to fix this right now. I felt good. The point is, there are always times in our lives when we need to check our phones, right? Maybe you're working on a busy project and it's that critical moment before the project goes live, or maybe just maybe you volunteer for the emergency services in your spare time, and for that night and that night alone you are on call, and it truly is a matter of life and death. But my argument is that it's not every night. It's not all the time. And yet, what do we do as human beings? We drift into that experience. We catch ourselves doing it. You'll be sat at home watching Coronation Street. And occasionally, very rarely, Coronation Street is a bit rubbish. And what do you do when Coronation Street is a bit rubbish? Well, typically today, you don't get up and switch it off or find something else to do. You just lean forward and you grab the nearest digital device on the coffee table and then you start messing around on Facebook, right? And at this point, you are neither engaging in Facebook nor watching the television. You wake up 30 minutes later, the meerkats are on you thinking, my God, what happened there? There was no choice made. There was no positive conscious choice. You drifted into that experience. So again, we've got to start to reassert our relationship with technology. But the final coping mechanism I want to talk to you about is the one that we really have to focus on because it's the worst of all of them. And this is about the lie of multitasking. We're taught to be successful in the 21st century, even as a male of the species, I must be able to multitask. I must be able to do more than one thing I want. Now, the interesting thing is what we've forgotten is that multitasking is not a human trait. Multitasking is a concept from computer science that was invented in the mid-50s by a bunch of people in white lab coats who wanted to get central processing units to become more efficient. All that happened is we looked at it with envious eyes and we thought, oh, yeah, that looks good. Let's do that. Now, we've done studies. We've done studies with other people. We've looked at other people's study. We all agree 
The average human being, male or female, the whole gender thing is a myth, is a third less efficient when they try and do more than one thing at once. A third less, but it gets much worse. Because it takes us time as human beings to switch between contexts. We wanted to understand that at Microsoft. And when you're an organization like Microsoft, you can do some pretty interesting things. So we ran a bunch of experiments on our own people, right? Brilliant. And what we found is that there's this really interesting chemical and cognitive process that prevents people from being able to switch tasks quickly. Because our brains are wired on a reward mechanism. We're wired on this hormone called dopamine. Every time you do something that your brain feels contributes towards your future survival, you get a little hit of this hormone called dopamine, and it's quite nice. And the thing about dopamine is once you get one hit, you quite like another, thanks very much. But the real issue presents itself in the fact that our brain thinks that it's more beneficial for our future survival by clicking through more email, clicking on more links, looking for the next tweet, than it is going back to the hard work that we were doing before we got distracted. So when you're in the middle of doing something creative and you get distracted, that process kicks in. And what basically happens is you finish the distraction and before you go back to work, the process kicks in and says, hey, hang on a minute. Before you go back to the hard stuff, why don't you go and check your email out? Let's see what's going on on Facebook. Check the footy scores. And we meander our way back to work. The average time delay between the completion of, of the, the distraction and you getting back mentally to where you were before you were distracted is 23 minutes for every distraction. Now think about that. Add those two things together. On one hand, we have this thing that makes us a third less efficient, and it's compounded by the fact that every time we get distracted, it introduces a massive time delay into how we work. My question to you guys is, how long do we allow this insanity to go on before we start to realize there must be, there has to be, a better way for us to work? And the challenge with all of these coping mechanisms is they combine, and I would argue they leave us in a place where technology is actually disconnecting us from ourselves. We are losing the ability to think in a way that is befitting of human beings. Never mind the fact that we're also not getting to the point, the, to the true potential of what technology can offer. But the great news in all of this is this is happening simply because we've just got it the wrong way around. We walk around complaining about a world, a world of too much information, but we know in our hearts, that that information holds the keys to our future success. Our ability to be successful, either as an individual or as an organization, entirely rests on our ability to use this amazing information that now exists. We just have to start to see it in that light. We have to start to see it as something that we can do. And it starts here. It starts with a world of data. And data is really funny, right? Because on one hand, data is like a really boring topic. It's just a bunch of numbers and stuff, and oh, God, it's boring. But then the real challenge with data is we've never really valued it. Data is something that we typically generate as a byproduct of the process that we're doing. It's a byproduct with our business. We run our projects, we create our products, we run our advertising campaigns, they generate data. At the end of the project, once we've created the product, when we've delivered the campaign, only then do we look back to the data and we use the data to reflect on what happened. This is not the purpose of data. Data is the fuel of our future. Your ability to be successful as an individual or as an organization rests entirely on your ability to see data as this sort of entrepreneurial force that changes what you can do as a human and changes what you can do as an organization. And we're moving into a world of lots of data, lots and lots of data. And when you have lots of data, interesting things start to happen. The first is when you have access to more and more data, what's interesting is the answers to the questions you've been asking yourselves for years start to fundamentally shift. Now, this is my favorite example. Here's, here's two vehicles. We've got a Toyota Prius and a Land Rover Defender. Which of these two vehicles would you say is better for the planet, more environmentally friendly? Put your hand up if you think it's the Toyota Prius. Put your hand up if you think it's a trick question and it's the Land Rover <laughs> Defender. Put your hand up if you want to be a management consultant and you know the answer is, well, it depends, right? Because it does depend. It depends on how broad a view you take of the data. If we take a narrow view, and this is typically what we do today as organizations and individuals, we look on the little bit of data we've got. Let's look at fuel consumption. Well, of course, when you look at fuel consumption, the best of these two vehicles for the planet is the Toyota. That thing runs on water and pixie dust, hugs trees when you drive by. Not like the Defender, it drinks diesel. Well, back in 2008, the Americans took a different approach to this question. They took a, what they called a systemic view, which is basically amassing all of the data. They looked at from the creation of the components that go to make the vehicle through to the point at which the vehicle is thrown on the scrap heap. The best of these two vehicles for the planet is actually the Land Rover Defender. Now, why? 
Over 67% of every Land Rover ever made over the last 60 odd years is still on the road. You cannot break these vehicles. Trust me, I've tried several times. And if you do manage to break them, you can fix them at the roadside with bubblegum and baling twine. Now look, the point of this example is not to advertise Land Rover cars, although if you do have connections and they're looking for sponsorship opportunities, obviously <laughs> I'm interested. The reality is, look what happened to the question when you had more data. The answer fundamentally changed. This is your job now. Whatever you're doing in life, your job is to seek out as much data as you can find. You should smother yourselves in data. Because when you have that, only then can you take a systemic view. Only then can you see the big picture. But you must be careful. Because there are massive dangers that happen when you start to connect data in this way. The data has to be related. If it's not, you end up in a very dangerous place. This next example is one of the reasons why I love the internet. Because a proper grown-up academic was so worried about this problem, he dedicated a lot of research to proving the problem. He took two really, really important data sets. He took the changes in the average temperature of the Earth and he correlated them to the number of pirates operating in the Indian Ocean. And what you'll see, ladies and gentlemen, over time is that as the number of pirates operating in the Indian Ocean dwindles, the average temperature of the Earth increases. Yeah? Yeah, so here, on the basis of this evidence, I would put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, if we truly want to save the planet, it is not renewable energy we need. It is neither solar nor wind farms. It is simply more pirates. Right? <laughs> This is the danger of spurious data correlation. The data has to be related. We have to find a connection. Otherwise, we end up in this dangerous place. But the real gift of data is yet to come. And this is where the data that we have access to enables us to move out of a world of reflective data use into a world of predictive data use. Now, when I talk about prediction, I'm not talking about some half-baked down the pub on a Saturday afternoon, who's going to win the 320 at Chepstow prediction. I'm talking about properly statistical significant prediction. Microsoft have been doing this for the last couple of years. We predicted the outcome of the last Football World Cup. We got 15 out of 16 games right. We did the Scottish referendum in the UK. We got that right within 2% of the public vote. We're a consumer company. We've done X Factor. We've done Pop Idol. And even highlight of my own personal career, the Eurovision Song Contest. Oh, yeah. Right? And we're getting it right. Better still, we're making the algorithms that power that kind of prediction available to everybody. It's just a service that you call through our cloud service, through Azure. And basically, the question I need to leave you with here is, how would you run your lives, run your organization, run your businesses in a world where you can predict what will happen rather than reflect on what has happened? And you have to answer that question soon, because the capability for everybody to do this is just around the corner. What's making this possible is what I like to call a technological Copernican shift. Because like many of you, I probably spend far too long on Wikipedia. But a Copernican shift is basically, in 1534, Copernicus, he rocks up to his academic buddies. He says, you guys have got this all wrong, right? It's not the sun that goes around the earth. It's the earth that goes around the sun. And in that instant, everything we knew about the world around us, everything we knew about science, got turned on its head. We're about to go through the same experience again with our relationship with technology. Because think about it. Today, human beings, we, we evolve around technology. We gravitate around technology. Every time you want to use technology, you have to go to it. You have to pick up your phone. You sit in front of your computer. You sit in front of your telly. You sit inside your car. We're moving to a world, a world of ubiquitous computing, where the technology will surround us. Every floor tile, every light bulb, every wall, every surface, every window will be a device that is connected and spewing out data about the world around us. The floor tiles will know not just how many times they've been stood on, but how many times I've stood on them versus how many times you've stood on them. And if you take to that world of data, that cacophony of data, and you add to that a layer of what we call ambient intelligence, these are algorithms who work on our behalf to make sense of that data, you start to get to some really interesting results. Now, this stuff is already available. It's already happening. Most of this is already in your pockets. If you have an iPhone, you may be familiar with Siri. And Siri is powered by Microsoft's Bing. If you have an Android device, you'll be familiar with Google Now. If you have a Windows phone, you'll be familiar, or Windows 10, you'll be familiar with Cortana. These things are all examples of ambient intelligent agents who work on our behalf. Let me give you our example. Let's talk about Cortana briefly. Cortana knows where I am because that's where my phone is. Crucially, she knows where I'm going to be next. Not because she's psychic, but because she looks in my calendar. And what she'll do is if she sees that the two locations are different, 
She will then start to monitor the traffic outside, and if the traffic builds up, she will tell me I need to leave earlier than I, than I planned for. Think about that and extrapolate this up. In the future, I'll be able to get an email from the client. Basically, say, Dave, we need to meet with you next week, uh, next Tuesday, 10 a.m., New York City. Well, Cortana knows where New York is. She knows who the client is. She knows um, which airlines I like to travel. She knows I'm a bit tight, so I don't want some trendy Manhattan boutique hotel. I'm in a Holiday Inn on the outskirts. And at the same time, I get the email from the client. Cortana has already stitched together that experience. She's booked my flight. I've got the hotel. I know exactly what's going on. This is a world of ambient intelligence powered by ubiquitous computing. But we can go a step further. We can start to bring this life a bit more. And what I want to do is to show you this is a project that Microsoft Research have created that illustrates the power of ubiquitous computing and ambient intelligence. You know it's a research project because it has the catchy title of Situational Interaction, Mark Free. Right? And this is a world powered by sensors, connected devices, and algorithms interpreting the data from those devices. And I'll let the video play out, and then I'll explain it. I'll give you an example of how this might play out in the real world. So what you'll see here in a minute is you'll see two people approach an elevator. Because this lab has been equipped with sensors and cameras, not only do I know that two human beings are approaching the elevator, I also know specifically who those human beings are. I can do facial recognition. Now I know who they are. It means I can look in their calendar, I can see that they're both going to meeting room 5.13, which is on the fifth floor, so I can send the elevator to the fifth floor. They never have to press a button, they just walk into the elevator. This is the technology in action. Now, what I want you to think about is a much more a different application, a more real life application. And to illustrate this, I'll talk about a, a hobby of mine that I call the tube shuffle. Right? You'll have a different name for this hobby, but I guarantee you, you will have experienced this for yourselves. If you ever work in a big city, at some point in that time, you will have engaged in a process I call the tube shuffle. And it's basically when you're traveling somewhere in that city, and you know roughly where you're supposed to be, but you don't know specifically where you're supposed to be. I'll give you my example, and I'll use London. Right? So I'm traveling to see a customer I've never seen before. I know I'm roughly in the right place because I'm at the right tube station. But as I emerge from the tube station, I don't know specifically where I'm supposed to. Where do I go from the exit from the tube station? What do you do in that situation? Right? Well, you stuff your hand in your pocket, you type in the postcode of the office, and for the next five minutes, you're engaged in what I call the tube shuffle, right? which is you walking down the street like this. Right, it's this way. It's this way. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, hang on. It's this way. It, uh, no, maybe it's this way. And because my gaze is down here, I'm bumping into people. I'm stepping in dog poop. All of this stuff's happening because the technology has me sucked in. In this world, it's fundamentally different. Because as I emerge from the tube station, a little spring in my step, whistling a happy tune, the first digital billboard I pass knows it's me. Knowing it's me, it can serve me an ad that's contextual to who I am and the persona that I'm using at that moment in time. And crucially, knowing it's me, it can put a little green arrow in the bottom of the ad. Well done, Dave. The office is just down here, two doors on your left. This is a world of ubiquitous computing and ambient intelligence. Now, we've got lots to do to get ready for this. There are lots of issues around privacy. There are lots of issues around how do we build the infrastructure to make this possible. But this is the world that we're going into. What makes this possible is probably what I would argue is the most important technology that anybody on the planet is working on today. It's a technology called machine learning. Some people call it artificial intelligence. And it's not just Microsoft. We're all at it. Facebook, Google, you know, we're all invested in this technology. But all it is, is it's simply statistical-based pattern recognition. It's how algorithms are made. And I would bet that you will all be familiar with the first time you ever became aware of that technology, because I will bet it was when you were typing in a query to a search engine, and before you'd finished typing, the search engine had finished the sentence for you. And if you were like me, you were like, well, that was a bit weird. I'm looking over my shoulder. You know who's watching me? Simply statistical-based pattern recognition. All that's going on is the search engine is saying, based on the characters that you've just typed in and against the billions of other queries that have been typed into me today, the statistical probability of you going on to complete the sentence like this is 99%, so I'm going to suggest that as the first option. That basic ability to spot patterns in lots and lots of data enables us to build the most incredible services. Services that will not just change how we interact with technology, but will change how we interact with each other. I would argue in the fullness of time, they will also change and challenge what we think it means to be human. This is my favorite example of this. This is a technology that is already available today. You can try it for yourselves. It's in public beta, and it's using the power of machine learning to deliver real-time speech-to-speech language translation. Now, we demonstrated this a couple of years ago. We had a gentleman speaking German connected to a lady who spoke English via Skype. It's powered by Bing. Gentleman speaks German, lady hears English. Lady speaks English, gentleman hears German. Real-time, 
No human being involved, just some algorithms doing some pretty smart stuff, spotting patterns in lots and lots of data. I need you to think about the transformational capability of this kind of stuff because it changes our world. I think about it all the time. I think about this in the context of my 10-year-old son. On the basis of this technology, do I bother to get my son to learn a foreign language at school? Because the reality is, by the time he enters his world of work, it will be a redundant skill. Now, I get that's provocative. I get there are lots of reasons why we learn foreign languages at school. And of course, my son, he'll learn one or two languages, uh, just like everybody else. But as a result of this technology, when he emerges from his education, he will be able to speak another 152 languages fluently. He will be able to travel the world, communicate with locals as if he were a local, which will fundamentally change his cultural experience in life. This is the kind of power that machine learning is offering our society, and we have to get ready for it. If you want to understand how the algorithms work, this is a lovely example. It comes from some research from Cambridge University that basically says, if you speak English, as long as I keep the first and last characters of the word in the right place, I can mix up all the other characters. I can even misspell the words, and you'll still be able to read that. Is that true? Can you read the text? There are two reasons why I love this example, right? The first is because it's completely contradictory to the way that we're taught language at school. Because when we're at school, we're taught that language is logical. We're taught that language follows rules. We're taught things like I before E except after C. But what they don't teach us is that there are 923 exceptions to the I before E. There are more exceptions to the I before E rule than there are to the bloody rule itself. Language isn't logical. It doesn't follow rules. It follows patterns. And we innately know this as human beings because from the day we learn to read until the day we die, we create, curate, and tend to our own personal pattern of language. Every time you read something, you are making your personal pattern of language slightly better. Now, the second reason I love this example is it also shows you the limitation of machine learning because the algorithms are only as good as the patterns that they're provided with. What do you think happens when I show this slide to someone who's just beginning to learn to speak English? Or if I'd shown it to my son, I don't know, maybe six years ago when he was just forming his own language skills. At that point, those individuals haven't established enough of the pattern. This is nonsense and they can't read it. And this slide, this example, is the reason why for the foreseeable future, for the next decade or so, the algorithms will not take our jobs, the robots will not uprise because somebody has to create the patterns and that somebody is all of us. We have to create the patterns, we have to connect them in order to get the algorithms to do what they need to do. So what can you do with all this stuff? Well, there are first a few things that we've got to think about. If we want to get our relationship with technology right, if we want to get the true potential of what technology offers a modern society, we've got to do a few things. The first thing is, We've got to recognize that we have all become ensnared by technology. Technology, in the way we use it, is the thing that constrains us. But then we have to realize that the real issue about that ensnarement has got nothing to do with the technology itself. It's got everything to do with what my dad calls the interface between the keyboard and the chair. It's us. The fact that you have too much email has got nothing to do with the email system. It's the people that send it. That's the problem, right? And this is the issue is we have to remember that we're the people who push the buttons. Now that we understand that technology has ensnared us, I would argue it's time for us to reinvent productivity. We have to think differently about productivity in a digital society. Because what we've forgotten in our current definition of productivity is that it is not about efficiency, it's about effectiveness. You can be as efficient as you like, but if the services you deliver are not loved by your customers or don't fulfill the objective, I would argue, why are you doing them at all? Let me give you an example. If I'm a nurse, right, I can be the most efficient nurse in the NHS. I can deliver more, uh, I could administer more injections than any other nurse on the ward. I would argue, though, in doing that, my quality of patient care is probably not as high as it should be. And we see this example right around us. So what we've got to do, instead of thinking about the process of work, we've got to start focusing on the outcome of what you do. And this is where we come in. This is where Microsoft comes in, because this is our job. And you can belittle this if you want. Somebody's one of these trite mission statements from a big American software company. We want to empower everybody to achieve more. I would argue for the last 40 years, this has been at the heart of what Microsoft's trying to do. 
We want to create a platform that enables people to achieve more in their lives. Whatever you choose to do, whether it's a computer scientist or not, is, is actually irrelevant. I just want to make sure, I don't care who you are, I don't care what vocation you choose, I want to make sure that technology can be used, or you can use technology in your life to deliver a positive outcome. That's why we exist. We're building the platforms that make that possible. And the best bit is, because we've been doing this 40 years, because we have incredible teams like the ones at Microsoft Research, we get a little glimpse into the future before many other people. We see the things that are coming. And based on what we know are coming, we know that we've got a work to do to help people get ready for that work in, in that world as it's coming towards us. To give you an example of that world, I need to take you to another team inside our organization who are true envisioners. And what they do, their job, is to create a tangible vision of the future. And on the surface, this is predominantly science fiction, right? They create these videos that are predominantly, they're made up. They're very slick. They're done by the team who used to work at Industrial Light and Magic, so lovely special effects. But I want you to remember, when I play this video, just one thing. The guys who put this video together, they have one single design premise, is that they're not allowed to show a technological concept in this video unless it already exists today in our labs. So while you may not see products exactly like this, the functional principle that they will offer us humans already exists today. So I'll run the video and then let's talk about that. <laughs> Again, I need to remind you that you're not going to see products that look exactly like that, but the functional principle being offered already exists today. This is the world that we have to prepare for. We have amazing facilities in our labs. We've created, and you can imagine how much I love this, right? We've created a working replica of the Star Trek holodeck. I can walk into a room. Not only can the room be configured around me, I can project objects in three dimensions that without a dorky headset, I can pick up and interact with. This stuff is coming. And we have to get ready. But if we're still working like Victorians, we're never, ever going to get to the potential it offers. So how do we do that? Well, actually, there's a really simple thing. If we want to deliver transformational experiences to the people we care about, we've got to do two things. Number one, we have to establish a culture of transformational people. Every single person in the organization needs to feel like they can make a difference. They need to be empowered to question, to challenge, to think, to come up with new ideas. 
And if you're lucky enough to have that culture, then you have to understand that those people will only ever be successful if they have access to the tools that enable them to work in transformational ways. You will not be, I promise you, no matter how hard you try, you are never ever going to be transformational over email. Right? Not even as an attachment, right? It's just not going to happen. So when you've got the people working in the right place, then you've got to start focusing on the outcome of what you do rather than the process of what you do. And it's funny because as I was coming here this afternoon, as I was walking just outside the station, I saw a bloke with the high-vis coat on. He's walking down the middle of the road. He's dropping little spots of white paper, white, paper, white powder in the middle of the road. And I walk up and, what are, you, what, what, what are you doing? And he looked at me and said, it's all right. I'm putting down elephant powder. Elephant powder? What are you doing that for? He looked at me, keeps the elephants away. But there aren't any elephants in Cambridge. And he turned to me and said, yeah, I know. It's good stuff, isn't it? Right? <laughs> I'm here all week, right? Um, <laughs> the thing is, our organizations are filled with elephant powder. It's the stuff you do that is completely irrelevant or redundant in a modern digital society. Our job now is to seek out that elephant powder and to get rid of it, to find it in our organizations, find it in the processes, in the things we do, in the way we live our lives, and eradicate it because it's holding us back. It's the thing that's stopping us from being successful. We have to think differently, and this is really hard for human beings because we have to think very differently about the future. As humans, what we tend to do is we assume that the future is a straight line, and it's a straight line extrapolated from where we are today from where we used to be in the past. But the future is never a straight line. It bounces around like a pinball. And the problem is, when we think the future's of a straight line, it constrains our thinking. I'll give you an example from the UK of where this thinking's being constrained right now, and it's in the world of autonomous vehicles. Now, don't get me wrong, autonomous vehicles are incredible feats of technology. There's amazing technology that goes into them. But broadly speaking, it's an industry who's locked into thinking that the future's not really going to change. Because when you start to look at the numbers, you start to realize that it won't be until 2040 that 50% of all miles driven will be driven autonomously. That number doesn't hit 100% uh, until we get to 2070. Do you seriously want to tell me that by the time we get to 2070, we will still think the best way to transport human beings around the local environment is inside a tin robotic box? That cannot be the case. Because if Amazon is preparing to deliver packages to my house using a drone, am I not, an, a, a, albeit a bigger and significantly heavier package? But be, the automotive guys, they can't see that because they're locked into this thinking. But there are other problems with this thinking. Regulation, legislation is locked into this kind of thinking. We're lucky if the regulators regulate for today's world. Typically, they're regulating for yesterday's world. Okay, Do you want to... I'm regulating for this world. Okay. You're, you're out of time. I'm out of time. Okay, give me two minutes and then I'll be right with you, John. <laughs> He's tough, right? Do you want to know what the first law that the UK has passed with the provision of autonomous vehicles on UK highways? is that there must be, at all times, a human being inside the vehicle. I don't know, let's call them the driver, right? Whose job it is to monitor the controls. The real problem with this thinking, however, is the opportunity cost of that thinking, because for every moment an automotive engineer is thinking about the future of transportation being this, nobody's thinking about these things, or more importantly, nobody's actually thinking about this, <laughs> which is what we all want. So I have two requests. As human beings, I need you to do two things. Number one, I need you to be mindful about what you're doing. And I'm not talking about the West Coast US definition of mindfulness, where it's about meditation and Zen Buddhism. If you want to do that, it's up to you, right? I want you to think about the British version of mindfulness, which is about just being pragmatic. So if you're the sort of person who sits in a meeting with your laptop open taking notes, or you're in the pub or the cafe with your friends and family checking out your Facebook, stop that. Technology offers you nothing at that moment in your life. You have to, as a human being, make a very simple choice at any moment in time. Can technology help what I'm doing right now? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, fantastic, fill your boots, engage. If the answer is no, turn it off, put it down, and leave it alone. Secondly, I need you to think about creativity. We will get nowhere in this society if we squeeze out all of the time, all of the capability for us to be creative. I would argue that we've lost space for creativity. We've lost the mental space. We've lost the physical space. We have to claw that back. Create some time in your day where you can just think. Create some time when you can be bored, because that's when you're most creative. Create a physical space where you can go to do work without being disturbed. And I'll leave you with this, this one final thing that puts technology into perspective. And it's from a quote from a wonderful guy called Pablo Picasso. Fantastic quote. In the mid-60s, he's being interviewed by an arts magazine, basically asking him, what do you think about computers today? Why they're asking Pablo Picasso this, I'll never know. 
But the genius of his answer is that even the computers today are fundamentally different to the computers he had back in the mid-60s. His answer was perfect because his answer was this. Computers, computers are useless. All they can give me are answers. What I need is something that can ask the right questions. And ladies and gentlemen, that something is you. That's your job, whatever you're doing. If you can be crisp about the question that you need to answer, if you understand the outcome, the objective of what you need to do, we all know the technology will make short work of that. So be crisp about the question. Get the technology in the right place. Remember that you're pushing the buttons. If you do that, I guarantee you, then and only then, will we as human beings be able to rise up and achieve all of the potential that technology offers our society. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, um, Dave, for that uh, stirring and beautifully delivered sermon. Um, uh, we, we, you, your injunction at the very end was, was to, uh, to, uh, to invite people to ask sharp questions. OK, we have a few minutes, uh, and we, have, we can take some sharp questions. Who wants to go first? Sir. OK. Um, Cambridge has some very big problems. What can Microsoft research? Um, do to crack them. Cycles go missing all the time in the city, and still it's not a standard thing for bikes to have GPS tracking in. I know that there will be devices coming soon, but it's, you know, some things in technology are just too slow. We know that you could have that kind of technology cheaply and in every bike, and it would smash the thieves where it hurts. Um, why is it not here? Um, well, I'm, you're saying I should work harder, is basically there. <laughs> um, what can a company like you... Um, well, I, I, I think there's a, there's a different way to look at this. One of the things I think you'll see happen, and this is really down to a world of artificial intelligence and machine learning, is we're already in a place now where we can start to predict crimes before they happen. So we've got police forces in the UK, actually in Cambridgeshire, we've also got police forces in places like New York City, who use artificial intelligence based on the data that they've generated over the last few decades to be able to predict the crimes before they happen. So in the case of your bike theft, I'd know that this is a certain hotspot. I could send a squad car out there at a certain time to prevent that from occurring. They're the things that we can affect. We can create a platform that enables other companies to generate the GPS devices or whatever in this instance. I think for us, what I'd rather see is something that would resolve Cambridge's traffic flow. God, you know, the benefit to the world and that would just be wonderful. <laughs> okay, another question? Uh, yeah, so in the world we envisage where we're always trapped and boards can spot me coming, how do we opt out? If we, I mean, I'm all for it. Yeah, you know, well, for well example, we... The very idea which it takes. Yes, so, so we need to do a few things, right? So first of all, we need to rebuild trust. Right? And, and trust doesn't exist in multiple levels today. We don't trust big companies like Microsoft and Google. We don't trust the government. Uh, we don't trust the health service. We don't trust the media. We don't trust anybody. And, and we kind of got ourselves to blame for that. So what we need to do in this kind of world, first of all, we need to be open and transparent. So we need people, when we start talking about data exchange, I need to be really open. If you give me your data, here's what's going to happen. See that guy over there, he's an advertiser. And I'm going to give him that data, and you're going to see great adverts. The second thing I have to do is I have to make it really, really uh, explicit about the value you'll get as a result. It can't be that you see bad adverts, and then the final thing I need you to do, you can decide. You decide whether you want to be part of this or not. If that's, I, that's the question, really, is that uh, how do you set it up so that this is fundamentally built in from the start? So I see a lot of people think about how to make this technology work, what's the uh, barriers to overcome. We'll have to think about privacy. How, how, do you, how do you opt out of a, a, a world with the Internet of Things? How, how do you opt out of it? Well, there, there's, there's a lot you, you of can't. great... There's no opting out of this. There, there are ways and means. So let me give you uh, an, um, an example of something that's happened with Microsoft Research in this building, actually, or, or this part of the organization. We uncovered a, pro a problem in privacy called differential privacy, which is I can take two big data sets, both anonymized, and I can use some pretty smart maths to de-anonymize the data. 
Because we know that principle, I can now start to do things about it. And in fact, a team here has been working with the utility companies around the world to make sure when they deliver your meter that enables them to micromanage what consumption you are, that they don't also betray your privacy because those smart meters betray what time you get up when you're at home when you should be at work. So it's a cat and mouse game. The thing I'm really, I guess I want to respond to your point with is this is a conversation that our entire society has to get involved in. And it can't be down to governments, and it can't be down to tech companies like Microsoft and Google. We all have a part to play. But again, the part of this is that we need to spell out what's on offer. We need to show you that what I'm offering you in this world is not a world of rubbish advertising. This is not a world of more spam. It should be a world of greater service. And if we understand that, then we can build a principle that keeps the people safe. And I think we're at a pivotal moment in our society. We've got things from the extremes of Edward Snowden to what's going on with Apple and the FBI to all of the stuff we know is going on. This is a really, really difficult time because it's the real pinnacle of this stuff coming together and we've got to figure it out together. My concern is that I think that's the attitude most people have got is that if we just persuade the benefits nobody will want to opt out. So don't, don't worry about it. Just keep hammering the benefits and everybody will I, 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 let me give you, I agree with the gentleman here. I, 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 let, me, let me just uh, counter that. And, we, and, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt but I, we're, we're running out of time. A lady in the middle? You talked about disconnection from people locally, and then the example of coming out of the tube and the ambient technology, surely coming out of the tube and asking a human being, hi, where's this building, and having a chat with that person, would actually create local connection. There are two problems with that statement, right? Number one, I'm a bloke. I ain't asking nobody for directions, right? Let's just get that straight. Uh, number two, how do I know? I had this today, coming to the station, when he was trying to park. So they, do you know where there is a car? I don't know. Not from around here. And so there is this part where, as a human, we want to, so we're not taking that choice away from you, but actually building a service that enables you to do that. We should also, and this is the sort of dichotomy face with technology, is I want to free your time up so you can go and have more human interaction. I don't want to free your time up so you can go and do more email, but you have to choose to do that as a human being. And that's the magic, right? Because this is where we have to do, is we have to remind human beings that they can engage with each other, that they can ask questions. And that's the piece that in all of this we've got to get to, is to balance the humans and technology out. When will the computers be asking the right questions? <laughs> that is a lovely, lovely question. What you're talking about, so, is what some people call the singularity. So this is when the machines, they create their own patterns, they become sentient. Um, I did some anecdotal research for this for the, for the book, and basically I looked at all of the estimates that people from science fiction writers to people from the technology industry had come up with. The average date is 2040. So there are lots of people who are going to think it happens sooner, lots of people are going to happen it later. Microsoft, or certainly some of our research fellows, are involved in a project called the 100 Years Foundation, which is a 100-year project looking at the challenges that AI may place to our society. So, uh, you know, it's an impossible question to answer. I think, personally, we're decades away from it being at that point, uh, but some people would say maybe sooner or some people would say later. I submit that the 100-year project, perhaps the last... 40 years ago, it's more be rather irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> they could be. They could be. Okay, uh, we have to stop it there, I'm afraid. I, I'm, I have a feeling that we could have gone on for another 40 minutes. Um, thank you very much for that very uh, elegant uh, presentation. Um, I was very moved by one thing you said, which was uh, that one of our uh, coping strategies is, is multitasking. Okay, and, and we're not very good at it. Um, that's my problem, and I once said to one of my um, techie friends, my problem is that I have, uh, I, I'm a multitasker with the wrong algorithm. And my engineering friend said to me, don't worry, we can have you reflashed. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank him for it. Lovely. And thank you, John. Thanks a lot. Thank you.